July 2021. After severe rainfall, the Ahr Valley in Western Germany was hit by an enormous flood. Water gushed through the villages, killing over 100 people and damaging thousands of houses. Extreme weather events are occurring more frequently all over the world, not just in Germany. Rising sea levels and heavy rainfall cause devastating floods. From now on, every day, somewhere in the world, we will have an extreme weather event, unprecedented weather event like we never had before. There are already over 20 million climate refugees worldwide today. If we don't take climate change seriously, there could soon be many more. By how much will the average global temperature rise? And how much more extreme will the extremes be? It's a question of life or death. The village of Altenburg in the Ahr Valley, a few weeks after the devastating flood. The clear-up operation is in full swing. 90% of the houses were damaged. Since the river also transported toxic oils, almost all the buildings have to be stripped down to the masonry. Sasha Meyer was also affected by the disaster. The night of the flood is something he will never forget. In the moment, uh, At that moment, all I could do was shout out to my wife, we are flooding. Then she came out of the room carrying Jack. I grabbed John, and then we made our way straight to the attic. The family spent the whole night there. Sasha removed the roof tiles from one part of the roof. We needed to find an emergency exit because the water kept on rising. I looked out of the small window and the water had risen to the second row of roof tiles. We kept in contact with our neighbors. They were also in the top part of their house. You can see how far up the water came. They were also worrying about how high the water would rise. It was a terrifying moment, because we just didn't know when it would stop. That night, the Myers lost everything they had. Just 15 months previously, they had bought their house and moved in. From the ground floor, we managed to salvage the family records and my children's savings books. We had to throw everything else away because it was covered in mud or oil or just filth. At that moment, it was all about surviving, and we did survive. For many years, scientists have been warning that extreme weather conditions would increase with climate change. Kira Vinka has no doubts that the situation is deadly serious. At the moment, we're roughly one degree above the pre-industrial age temperature, which means we are already in the midst of climate change. We have to realize that the effects are increasingly serious. It's not a linear change. It won't just get a little bit worse. It can get considerably worse with every degree of global warming, which means a very, very tough challenge for us to adapt to climate change. the Geographic Institute of the University of Bonn. Lothar Schrott heads the master's program on the prevention and management of catastrophes here. The risk researcher sees huge communication deficits shortly before the flood in the Ahr Valley. There was a storm warning, a warning of a flood, but the residents didn't know what the consequences might be. They didn't know, what should I do now? I heard reports of some people taking amateur precautions and driving their car right to the top of the Ahr Valley. In the end, it was the only car left. The others were all swept away. The disaster in the Ahr Valley showed how ineffective Germany's early warning system is. But what should be done now? 
I think we need a mix of different methods. People talk a lot about these warning apps. I have two myself on my cell phone. But if the mobile network is down, then the apps are of no use. That has become clear. A simple and effective measure would be flood sirens, for example. They could warn all local residents of an impending disaster. But the siren has to go off in plenty of time, not when we can already see the water. If they know three or four hours ahead, then they should sound the siren and train people how to react in a situation like that. It's no good everyone getting in their car and the roads all getting blocked up with traffic jams and people drowning that way. Rüdiger Fuhrmann, the local mayor and a member of the Voluntary Fire Brigade, is still stunned by the events. We had received warnings that the flood level would reach five and a half meters. We heard about it in the afternoon in our fire station, but we could hardly believe it because we thought, where should all that water come from? Five and a half meters. That would have been about two meters higher than in 2016. We simply couldn't believe it. In the end, the river was up to nine metres high, flooding buildings right up to the roof. The Netherlands are much further ahead of Germany when it comes to flood protection. For centuries, they've been wresting land back from the sea. In the past, windmills helped to lower the water level. Nowadays, powerful pumping stations work around the clock to keep the land dry. Around a quarter of the Netherlands are below sea level. Engineers are building even higher dikes and flood barriers, like in Nijmegen. The whole town is surrounded by a protective wall. In times of flooding, the openings can be closed off by gates or with special steel profiles. This is how a steel profile looks. We use them to make a so-called coupure. They are stacked on top of each other, and the rubber profile ensures that the flood wall is sealed. And this is where the coupure is built up. First, we remove this cover. Behind it, there is the frame for a flood wall, so we have double protection. First, we put in a base and then we lay one profile on top of another until they reach this height. Along with the safety barriers surrounding individual towns, the Dutch have built gigantic flood barriers along the North Sea coast. At the Marsland flood barrier, two metal gates, each 210 metres long, protect the land behind them. The Oosterschelde flood barrier stretches for nine kilometres along the coast. Although the Dutch have invested huge sums in flood management, they know that it will not be enough. Frank Spargarum was a member of the team which developed the Oosterschelde flood barrier. Most people agree that sea levels could rise by one metre by the end of this century. That would have enormous consequences for the flood barrier but also for the whole area behind it. If the water rises that much, I don't think the flood barrier will be able to hold back the water in 2100. It'll have to be torn down. Since higher dikes alone do not offer enough protection, the Dutch are now trying a new strategy living with the water instead of against it. The dikes are being lowered and new drainage channels are being built. In times of flooding, parts of the land will be flooded for a short period. The people who live in these areas are being relocated to artificially created hills, financed by taxes. Dutch technology could also help in Bangladesh. The south of the country is threatened by rising sea levels and floods as a result of climate change. 
In the north, the rivers carry huge masses of water in the monsoon season. Climate change is making the monsoon stronger and more unpredictable, with increasingly more land being flooded as a consequence. The renowned climate researcher Salimul Haq sees an obligation for rich countries. The vast majority of that pollution has come from the rich countries. Poor countries do some, but not as much as the rich countries. And therefore, the rich countries have a, a very strong responsibility to help the poor countries deal with that. In Germany, after you had the flash floods, uh, your chancellor, Angela Merkel, went and visited, and she immediately allocated and found 300 million euros to compensate German citizens from the impacts of loss and damage from climate change. Absolutely correct thing to do, but they should also think about victims in Bangladesh and in Africa who are suffering from their pollution, and they owe them a, a, a measure of support in financial terms as well. So far, little outside help has come to Bangladesh, and too little to offer effective protection. Measures such as sandbags, dikes and cyclone-proof housing can no longer keep the water at bay. As a result, more and more people are fleeing the countryside and moving to the cities. They try to build up a new existence there, crammed into the narrow alleyways of the slums. People like Jahurul, who came to the capital Dhaka with his parents in 2020, when a third of Bangladesh was underwater. He left his wife and children behind. Before the flood, we had a normal life. But we lost everything in the flood. We managed to survive by fleeing to the village school. After a while, we decided to borrow some money and come to Dhaka. Chahurul's parents borrowed the equivalent of around 10 euros to pay for their move to Dhaka. Now the three of them share a room which is smaller than 15 square meters. After we arrived, we searched for work for weeks. Finally, my son got a job in a clothing company and I was employed in a household. We earn very little and my husband has a heart problem. His medication is very expensive. Due to his health problems, the father is unable to work. He spends his days in a cafe or in bed. His son works in the textile industry, earning around 70 euros per month. But the medication for his father costs 40 euros alone. We have to manage to somehow get back to our village. My parents still live there. We came to Dhaka because we are poor, but we have to go back. Many people who come from rural areas to Dhaka every year hope to return, but few of them actually manage it. The city now has over 20 million inhabitants. Illegal settlements are sprouting up wherever there is free space. The infrastructure is overstretched. Once upon a time, we had our hundreds of canals in Dhaka city. And so the water easily could discharge and it could go. And surrounding the Dhaka city, we had our wetlands. Where is the wetland? Most of the wetlands are very much occupied by this and grabbed by these particular builders. Unfortunately, so this is a very unplanned situation. Urgent solutions are needed to stop Dhaka from collapsing. One of the things that we are working on and my center is working on is developing what we call climate resilient, migrant friendly towns. We have identified about 20 smaller towns and we are looking at ways in which we can attract the climate migrants to go to those towns and live there instead of come to Dhaka city. Solutions also have to be found for the rural population. Unlike the Netherlands, there is no money available for expensive projects. 
In the Ministry of Agriculture in Dhaka, agronomist Masharul Aziz is developing better early warning systems to alert the inhabitants of flood areas. We have the database of 30,000 lead farmers all over the Bangladesh. So in case of flooding, we uh, generate SMS, short SMS, tailored SMS, what to do for the farmers. We generally uh, circulate or disseminate this kind of SMS and IVR to the farmers. And these lead farmers, they uh, convey the message to their uh, group members. So in this way, we are uh, advancing uh, to uh, combat with the flood uh, situation. Another solution could come from the south of Bangladesh. In this huge river delta, large swathes of land have now been underwater for over eight months. Some farmers, like Obeda Mola, have revived an old technique for growing vegetables on floating plant beds. I watched my father doing it. He had a few plants on the water. But it wasn't systematic back then. We have developed it further. We don't have any other options if we don't want to starve. To make the floating beds, the farmer and his worker tie together rice straw, aquatic plants and cow dung. Then they grow their vegetables on the floating compost heaps. The vegetables grown on water taste better and have more vitamins. We don't need artificial dung or pesticide. That's why the vegetables are much better than those grown on land. Much better. The farmer has proved right by his success. His vegetables grow at record speed. Moller earns three times as much as other farmers in the region. Up to now, these floating gardens only existed in a small area in the south of the country. If one third of Bangladesh is going to be permanently flooded in the future, as researchers predict, they could be a model for other regions. Not all plants can be grown on the floating beds, however, such as the staple food, rice. The huge rice fields are often flooded for days at a time, which endangers the crop. Researchers are developing new types of rice. These uh, varieties, they can uh, tolerate up to 15 days of submergence. So this kind of, uh, uh, we are advocating our farmers uh, to, uh, uh, to plant this kind of uh, uh, rice varieties in flood-prone areas. And also we make some buffer seed beds in different uh, high places uh, where uh, when the water recedes, we generally, uh, we generally distribute the seedlings to the farmers. None of these measures can prevent large parts of Bangladesh being uninhabitable in the future and the country is already five times more densely populated today than Germany. Bangladesh cannot adapt to everything. So the sea level rise, for example, in the low-lying coastal area is becoming saline. We are adapting to salinity with uh, saline tolerant varieties of crops. We are switching from rice to growing shrimp and crab, but there's a limit to how much we can adapt. Sooner or later, the uh, people living there will not be able to continue their livelihoods. They'll have to leave. Mozambique 2019. Cyclone Idai swept across the Southeast African country, flooding huge parts of the coastal regions. International aid organizations had to save people from drowning. The port city of Baira was particularly badly affected. Huge parts of the city were flooded and the slum by the water was almost completely destroyed. Thousands of people had to flee. The situation two years on. Julia Mahanguiza used to live in the slum. 
All this area was my house. The walls were here. Here I had rooms to rent. And here my three rooms. Everything collapsed. A woman lost her life there when a brick fell on her head. Julia no longer lives here, but her former neighbors have stayed. When the cyclone came, we didn't know what to do. Some people moved away, some are still here. We all need to be moved from here. We have no other place to live. That's why we stayed here. We are asking for help. We are in a bad situation. Really bad. We have to find something to eat and try to survive. The local authorities were planning to relocate all of the slum dwellers after the cyclone, but many do not want to leave. They can find casual jobs both in the slum and in the nearby town, for example as fishermen or street vendors. They accept the risk of having to rebuild their homes after every flood. Around one hour away from Baira, here the government has initiated a project to resettle people from flood-prone areas. Small houses have been built for the inhabitants, but only the outer shells. The residents themselves who recently moved here are responsible for further building work. Julia Mahanguiza also received an offer to move here with her three daughters. When we came, this area used to be only bush, so we started working. But we need electricity, and they have also stopped food aid supplies. We are old people, and we can't do much here. None of the houses are finished so far. There's no material for the roof. Instead, people have been living in huts they built themselves next to the houses. Some of the new settlers try to scrape together a living from selling things. Most of them have to commute to the town to work, which is a great financial burden. The resettlement of the victims of climate change is too great a challenge for a poor country such as Mozambique. All they can do is offer better protection to people living on the coast. In Baira, for example, wave breakers are meant to prevent the erosion on the coast in storm tides. The ditches in the town have also been extended. The ditches were transformed into retention basins for the water whenever there is torrential rain. Besides flooding the communities, the water flows into the ditches, and the ditches work as receiver sections, that as soon as the tide is low, the water flows to the sea accordingly with the opening of the floodgates system. But the ditches are much too small for the masses of water caused by a cyclone like Idai in 2019. Instead, with foreign aid, the city is planning to build seven basins to absorb the flood water. Previously, there was only one, with no money to build more. Our country is not able to overcome the bitterness we feel on its own. And climate change is mainly caused by economically and financially robust countries. They urgently have to help the countries with less resources to face climate change. Germany currently contributes 4 billion euros per year to a green climate fund to support poor countries. But the German government has provided eight times as much money to rebuild the Ahr Valley in Germany, 30 billion euros.
Risk researcher Lothar Schrott takes a closer look at the situation in the R Valley. Some people are already occupied with reconstruction strategies, but we are still completely involved in the follow-up of the catastrophe, and a lot of money is flowing into that. If we had invested this money in the prevention of a catastrophe, it would have been cheaper and much more human. It's all the more important to draw the right conclusions to keep the Ahr Valley habitable. When we are in the Ahr Valley, we see vineyards, which have a high touristic value, and also for the individual winemakers, of course. But maybe mistakes were made here. For instance, instead of having small stepped vineyards, there are now large areas which are very steep. The vines are often planted vertically. Areas like this can barely absorb rainwater. They channel it directly into the valley. Forests are not prepared for climate change either. We can see from the land use that we have a high number of spruce trees, not deciduous trees. But deciduous trees can retain much more water, which slows down the flow. However, transitioning to a fully grown mixed forest takes over a hundred years, and such measures only help to prevent smaller floods. In the case of extreme flooding, structural solutions are required. It could be artificially laid retention basins, built where hollows are actually dug out and maybe equipped with barriers so that the water can't reach lower-lying areas. There could also be natural retention areas, like in the floodplains. This could avoid high water levels accumulating in tributaries which then flood the valley. But even such elaborate and expensive measures will not offer enough security in the long run. I think it would be a responsible approach now, when it comes to rebuilding, that people are advised against reconstruction in especially flood-prone areas. It would be irresponsible towards the people who settled there. It was previously claimed that disasters like the one in the Ahr Valley are a once-in-a-century occurrence. But it's now become clear that such events could now occur more frequently. We really have an existential challenge. We saw it in the Eiffel region, we see it now with forest fires worldwide. We see it in Bangladesh and Mozambique. More extreme climate consequences are visible everywhere. It means that we have to do much more, both in emissions reduction, mitigation, as well as in adapting to climate change. Everybody has to take responsibility now. In countries like Bangladesh and Mozambique, it's already too late.